This day, June 25th, marks the third year anniversary of Michael Jackson's death. It took some time for me to come up with the content that I wrote down and will share with you right now. For many people of my generation, the name Michael Jackson means so much and so many things come to mind when his name is spoken. No other celebrity has been poked fun at more than Michael Jackson. As a kid, he was a prodigy. Everyone liked him. As a young man, he was a genius performer, which everyone loved. Unlike pretty much every other musical performer, Michael had the ability to make you not so much want to be him as you wanted to be with him. When I was four or five years old, I really wanted the album entitled Bad, and my father bought it for me. I don't think I've ever been happier with a material gift other than that record. Not even in the, the Nintendo that I got a few years later. Unlike toys and video games that I had during that age where I would play with the toy or game first before letting anyone else play with them, I knew that other people had to enjoy this with me. It wasn't a listening party per se as it was an experience. For a number of years, Michael was still a big star, but the rumors of his life started getting crazier and crazier. Sleeping in a bubble, having a monkey named Bubbles, and one of the bigger ones, getting his skin whitened. Then there were the cases of having children over and doing strange things like sleeping in the same bed that led to, of course, allegations of him having sex with them. The perception of Michael Jackson completely changed in his late 30s, where it seemed like the mass media and social opinion about him shifted greatly. Parodies of his life were everywhere, from cartoons, sketch comedy programs, black comedy TV shows, which was probably the most harmful to Jackson looking back at it, especially due to the whole skin coloring thing. But parodies can be funny, some of them can be forgetful, or downright unnecessary and shoehorn in whatever program or performance that you're watching. Usually parodies are done by funny people, not comedians. There are two things I've studied outside of my academic life, that's pro wrestling and comedy. Both things I've lost interest in some years ago, but I would watch and read these things pertaining to those crafts that had no involvement with the entertainment aspect of either one of them. I wanted to know what made a pro wrestling match great or what made a joke resonate with its audience. Something I noticed about true comedians, not funny people, is that real comics are people that say things that are true but we didn't notice it until it was worded in a way that the artist said it. They have a bardic nature about themselves as other artists such as rappers seem to have this quality as well. As a group, N.W.A. was never the same after Ice Cube's rap song entitled No Vaseline. Easy e was never the same after Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg's Dre Day. Mob Deep was never the same after Jay-Z's song The Takeover. Kumo D was never the same after LL Cool J's Mama Said Knock You Out, and so on. Comedians make a lot of us laugh at ourselves for not having the perception that the comic gives to us. It's not about saying us something that we didn't know, as it is showing us something that we do know, but have yet to come to term with. People like Dan Cook are funny guys. People like Jay Leno are funny guys. They say many things that make us giggle and laugh, but they're not comedians. They're not bards. You see, bards are people that can make a satire about you. I'm not talking about Dungeons and Dragon bards or some RPG video game character class model bard. I'm talking about those people with a single book or monologue or vlog or article can completely change people's perception about you and in some ways crush you. Now, just because you've written or said something that has bardic nature doesn't mean that everything you write and say after that has bardic power. Maybe a bard says one thing that everyone at the same time can agree on, but it has to be true. This is why network political analysts are not bards. Guys like Rush Limbaugh or Tom Likas, 
they play a devil advocate role where they're speaking for a group of people that may or may not exist. If they get more notoriety from talking about politician or pop star X as they can get from talking about politician or pop star Y, then they'll choose X, the one that generates more publicity for them. But fame and truth are rarely the same thing. Let me paraphrase the words of Alan Moore in the documentary entitled The Mindscape of Alan Moore. Bards can destroy people by saying or writing a satire about the victim in the manner that resonates with society at the time. If a bard writes a clever satire meant to humiliate you, then your friends and family will turn their backs on you and having you destroyed within your own eyes. If a bard writes a clever and carefully worded satire, then years later after you're dead, people will look back at you and laugh at you in your pettiness, absurdity, and wretchedness. After years and years of people making fun of Michael, after all the parodies, nothing struck more of a chord with society as much as the piece that Cat Williams performed on his HBO special, The Pimp Chronicles. Here's a clip. Fuck Michael, telling niggas that done paid good money for him, telling us shit that don't make no goddamn sense. Talking about he put his nigga dick in a white woman and came out with two babies that ain't mixed. Who the fuck do you think you talking to, nigga? I'm a grown motherfucking man. You put a nigga dick in a white woman and got two blonde, blue-eyed babies? Nigga, fuck you. Fuck you. One of them babies' name is Blanket. You can't name no nigga baby Blanket. You can't name a nigga baby nothing soft. Not Blanket, Quilt, Comfort, or none of that shit. After seeing this Cat Williams piece, I really would like to know how would Michael Jackson be seen by those who were born in the mid to late 90s? Right now, it's way too close to his death before anyone can make fun of the king of pop again. No one at this point in time knows how Michael Jackson will be remembered in the years to come. Will his whole body of work be accounted for? Would he be looked at as like Michael Jackson Part 1, the child prodigy, and then Michael Jackson Part 2, the adult? Or even worse yet, would he be remembered as Black Michael Jackson and White Michael Jackson? Unlike other celebrities that have had parodies done about them, Jackson has the ability to alter people's consciousness with his music. That's why there were, are, and will be better performers than Michael, technically speaking. But few will ever achieve the level of admiration he had, especially within his prime. I don't want to repeat myself, but I really would like to know how the King of Pop would be remembered. Will he be someone considered to be the gr one of, if not the greatest music performer of all time that spanned it over decades? Or will he be something closer to what Cat Williams said about him? I feel that the sheer amount of information that is absorbed and available today, there'll be a bit of both. Maybe the next generation would say that the media in the 90s were too hard on Michael and caused some sort of mental breakdown. Maybe they'll acknowledge it, but still not care and call him a pedophile. Is there enough power in his music to offset the satire by Cat Williams and the countless parodies of Jackson's behaviors? No one will know for some time. Here's a small video of me and a good friend of mine rowing a boat in New York about nine months after Michael Jackson passed away, reflecting on the moment when we heard the news of his, of his death. Take care. Burgers at Washington Square Park. Whatever, just talking. Yeah. And all of a sudden, and we heard Michael Jackson and dive. And all of a sudden, this gigantic chorus of people start saying, "I'll be there." Strange. It's really weird. We, we like at, at simultaneously, well, like the, do they well, set well, it up? Park always has the park people playing music. Uh huh. Because it's NYU territory, you know. Yeah. So it's a lot of idiots. <laughs> so, so they're usually like a really good jazz band or a really bad jazz band or something like that. And what happened was, they were, um... You okay there? I'm good. I like that. So we're talking about the death of Michael Jackson, where we were while riding a boat for the first time in our lives. Kind of, kind of, uh, very, very emo. <laughs> riding a boat, talking about the death of Michael Jackson. It's very ironic. <laughs> but anyway, so we were at, I was at, and so there was these people playing guitar, and they started playing all Michael Jackson songs. 
I guess they had been playing all afternoon, they didn't really notice it, but when they did I'll Be There, a gigantic chorus of people joined them. Oh my. So it was just like 30 people singing I'll Be There. Jesus Christ, man. Let me stroke and let me give you let me give you my rundown of what happened the day Michael Jackson died in South Korea. Okay. Continuing oh let just move over here a little bit. You know, continuing the story of uh, the day that you know, I heard Michael Jackson died, I was in South Korea teaching English. I'm, I'm on my face, I'm a crotch. Somebody shot. No um, <laughs> um, the thing is is that I showed all my all my kids um, I showed them like this little highlight video of Michael Jackson. A lot, most of the kids don't really care about it because they only know like new Michael Jackson. Like they know dangerous and stuff like that. But I showed them a. Uh, but no, but ev everybody forgot how good the way you make me feel was. Yeah. That was a great song. And you know, but the thing is, one thing about it is I forgot how great of a video Smooth Criminal is. That was a great video. And I showed them the full nine minute version of um, Smooth Criminal. What I do for my children is that if they're good, they get to watch a music video that's just not, you know, K-pop or anything. And uh, at, at, since then, they've only requested a Smooth Criminal by Michael Jackson. Mainly because it's ten minutes long, they don't have to do work. But uh, <laughs> but it is, it is one of the best. That's not the one where he comes out as a panther at first, is it? No, no, no. That's, that's the one where he's like a, like a 1920s gangster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It has one of the best bass beats of all time. So there, that, that was my story. That is a great bass beat, now that I think about it. Of, um, well, a lot of Michael Jackson's work, like all the best work, is all the famous um, bass beats. And then... Yeah, Quincy Jones was a great, great producer at the time. I know. Um, my sister had a great quote. She said... The day Michael Jackson died, I did nothing but watch Weird Al videos. <laughs> <laughs> you had beat it, eat it, fat. You know us. Uh, uh, hey, we're running like this is clutter of a bunch right now. Let's turn this off.